his cottage over the weekend, and the pain was actually so significant that he felt like his right side of his lung wasn't getting as much air in as the left side. And I thought, well, okay, that, that's fine. Because when I develop a differential diagnosis in my mind, I'm actually going through, okay, is this 27-year-old man developing cardiac pain or is it pulmonary pain? I'm thinking chest wall, chest wall, chest wall, chest wall, okay? That's what's going through my mind. It's near the end of the evening. And so then we prepare for the physical examination. And in fact, the physical examination is intending to corroborate or refute what's in my differential diagnosis. And I think that that's really something that's, that's very important. You've all heard that your diagnosis is pretty much made on history. But last night's example, and I brought David in because he's got a younger pair of ears than me, my physical examination, all of a sudden, number nine on my list became boom, 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 number one on my list. And what was it, David? Pneumothorax. It was a pneumothorax. And in fact, I had to go back and say, you know, why would you have a pneumothorax? Oh yeah, Thursday night I took a pretty hard hit in hockey. So in terms of the sport medicine component of that, that's not really as relevant as in family medicine. You're going through a list of differential diagnoses while you're doing your history, and then when you do your physical examination, you, you want to corroborate or refute uh, those uh, items that, that are on your list of differential diagnosis. So the examination of the knee and the shoulder are exactly the same premise. Your experience and cognitive skills are going to give you that list for differential diagnosis. But what the folks who have been with me in my office have understood very quickly is that there are certain things that you're going to be thinking about. So when I ask for a differential diagnosis of medial knee pain, I always, always hear, oh, MCL, MCL, in that golfer who all of a sudden just got sort of pain while golfing on the 15th hole, it's an MCL injury. Excuse me, but your MCL is going to go like that on the 15th hole when you're just twisting? MCL is a traumatic injury, and you think of it, we saw a football player yesterday, I think, and we knew that he was hit from the outside, valgus strain with a foot planted, that's MCL. And your experience of cognitive skills is going to put that right up at the top of your differential diagnoses. Whereas that golfer with a twisting injury is, is actually much, much more likely to have a medial meniscus tear based on degenerative basis, especially if they're an old guy like me. So I think that your physical examination is not starting from scratch. Your physical examination is, is based upon the history that you've already built that foundation. It's almost like doing the trim carpentry when you've already got your walls up and your drywall ready and you're just making things look nice in your mind so that you can then proceed to your management plan. Uh, the examination skills for a family physician should not be what an orthopedic surgeon or a rheumatologist do, is doing. And that way, folks, just you can relax and you can learn a set of skills that, in fact, will increase the sensitivity and specificity for each particular test. So, as you may have seen in the lecture that I gave uh, in August, I have four different types of things that I do for meniscal tears. I have three different types of things I do for ACL tears in the knee, specifically because each one does not have a high enough set sensitivity or specificity. Um, the examination should clarify also some management choices, and we're going to try and see today how if you have a symmetry of your scapulae when you're abducting your arms at the shoulder, if you've got symmetry, a patient with rotator cuff tendinopathy might be treatable just by you giving that patient the exercises. However, if there's asymmetry, then you don't really have a stable base. And I gave the example yesterday, I haven't given it very often, but a stable base is almost like dancers up on a, on a moving float during a parade, okay? If that road is bumpy and that float is bumping all over the place and comes to a stop, those dancers are not going to be nearly as smooth as if that 
platform is moving along smoothly. And so think of the scapula as a moving base for the humerus to, uh, to move upon. And so the context of that is if you do not have that stable base, if you have asymmetry of your scapulae, perhaps when you diagnose that case of rotator cuff tendinopathy or tendinitis, you're actually going to refer the patient to a physiotherapist to help them reestablish that stable base and that effective movement of that scapula. Uh, the reason why I'm here today is because the lecture that I gave to you folks in August was inherently weak. Uh, I, I, I'm my own worst critic, but I knew right up front that trying to give you a lecture with 200 or more people in one big room and show you knee examination techniques was not going to really work. And I tried my best. Having said that, two years ago when we did the similar lecture for your colleagues that preceded you on the shoulder, it worked a little bit better, but still the people way in the back couldn't see very well. So my pal Feroz, who I picked on during the lecture in August, because he and I have the same hairline, we, we um, had a lovely discussion outside afterwards and, and he berated me for the fact that I tried to do knee examination in front of 250 people. And so that's why I'm here today. And that's why we have our videographer because Feroz would like to go over the fine points and I think so would you to go through the fine points of my shoulder and knee examinations. Uh, I would like to end the sort of uh, yakking part of this by just saying that as a family physician, if you can do the same examination of the knee, the same examination of the shoulder on a very consistent basis, it then becomes seamless, it becomes quick, and you don't miss anything when you have surprises like yesterday's pneumothorax, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to ditch the seats and I'm going to ever get everybody to come up here because we're, we're going to try and do this uh, on a very much, you see it up close basis. We can do this with this size of uh, crowd. Uh, don't be shy because I'm going to pick on every single one of you. There's enough to do and I'm going to do this in the following format. I'm going to do my shoulder examination first reasonably quickly. I'm going to go through the whole thing. If uh, I miss something then Feroz is going to uh, say, oh you missed that and, and that's fine because sometimes you do. Nobody's perfect. But then what we're going to do is we're going to repeat the whole shoulder examination part by part with each one of you you know, coming up and, and, and showing me how you do it, and if I correct you, uh, I'll try and do it in the most pleasant way so that this is an excellent learning experience for all. So, uh, are you our shoulder patient? Okay, 